Hello everyone and welcome back to the CG compositing series. I'm Tony Lyons and today we're going to be talking about material AOVs and taking a close look at what the differences are between diffuse, specular, and emission. We talked in the last video about the different categories of render passes, that there are beauty rebuild passes, material AOVs, and light groups, and there are data passes, utilities, and IDs, which help you with uh, masks, motion vectors, and stuff like that. So we're going to be focusing on uh, the first category of the beauty rebuild pass, which is material AOVs. Here's an overview of all the material AOV render passes that you'd find in the Redshift fruit ball render. Now there seems like there's a lot of passes here, but you actually don't need to use all of them. There is uh, different levels of complexity, and depending on your comp, you might need to make an overall change or get deeper into the complexity and nitty gritty of things to change uh, um, some deeper level uh, aspects of your comp. So as I mentioned, there are different levels of complexities that you could rebuild the material AOVs in. And I think it's best to start with the most simplest subdivision and then move on to intermediate examples and complex examples. So each column in, uh, in this slide represents a potential rebuild that you could do with your material AOVs. So in the simple category, we have the most basic ideas or concepts that uh, you can split the material AOVs into. So the main concepts, so the main divisions are diffuse, specular, emission, and then we have a separate category for reflections and refractions, which I'll explain at a later point. And they need their own little category because they're very special. So as we move over to the intermediate column, we're going to be subdividing uh, what we have on the simple column. So the diffuse category could be subdivided into direct diffuse, indirect diffuse, and subsurface scattering, for example. Specular could be subdivided into direct specular, indirect specular, things like reflection, coat, and sheen, which you see in Arnold renders. These are all parts that, that can uh, be added up and make up specular. The emission pass doesn't really get subdivided. It's kind of the same. It's one level. It's just emission. So uh, we carry that through intermediate and complex because you're going to be using the same uh, pass. And once again, reflections and refractions are kind of their own category, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but they also get carried through. So, so we're really actually just focusing on subdividing two main categories, which is diffuse and specular. If we wanted to get more complex, we could start introducing passes like raw diffuse lighting, texture or color maps, also called all albedo maps. Uh, in the specular section, we could introduce raw specular, raw reflection, a specular filter, or a texture map. So if you wanted to get the absolute most use case of all the material AOVs here, you could probably go with the more complex uh, version. So each of these columns, simple, intermediate, and complex, uh, represent rebuild options. And I think it's best to start with the most simplest subdivision, which is the diffuse, specular, and emission. Getting a full understanding of that category and what those passes are accomplishing, and then we can move on to the next subdivision of intermediate passes and finally reaching the more complex, smallest parts. The idea being that if you can accomplish what you need in the simple category, then your comp will be lighter and more efficient. Uh, but if you want control of every single piece of your render down to the smallest component, then you could set up a larger, more complex node tree. I'm not sure if this graph fully explained the uh, categories diffuse specular and emissions, so I made a, a separate graph here. Um, so you can see that uh, you have the big categories here, diffuse, specular, and emission, with some exceptions, uh, which is true reflection and refraction. And so if we subdivide these categories within the category of diffuse, we have direct diffuse, indirect diffuse, subsurface scattering, and in specular, we have direct specular, indirect specular, coat, sheen. And then subdivided even more, uh, we have additional components, which is raw diffuse lighting, texture color, or albedo, and raw specular reflection and specular filter. And emission doesn't have a subcategory and neither do the exceptions. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that every pass that you have basically fits into only a couple buckets, diffuse, specular, or it's emission. Emission's easy because, well, it's very easy to spot. And, and then you have a couple other exceptions, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the two main buckets um, that you can put your passes in are diffuse and specular. So that's what we're going to be focusing now on uh, trying to explain the difference between diffuse and specular. And I realize that this is the CG compositing series, but I think I'd be doing an injustice if I didn't explain the kind of the concepts of diffuse, specular, and emission, because if you don't know what you should be looking for, then 
you won't know which category to put the pass in. And so I'm going to be um, putting the others and the exceptions to the side, and I'm going to uh, teach you the difference between diffuse and specular and emission. Okay, so let's talk about specular, diffuse, and emission. And here are some kind of classic examples uh, with some basic shaders that, uh, from CG. And uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about in this upcoming kind of slideshow is based on physically based rendering theory, uh, also known as PBR. So if you ever see PBR, um, it, it's going with a more kind of scientific approach uh, towards rendering, towards shading and, and lighting. Right off the bat, I want to start with some uh, basic descriptions or adjectives of what each category kind of is. And we're going to start with the specular column. So words that are describing a specular pass might be reflection, mirror, shiny, glossy, wet, metallic, highlights, pings, crisp, sharp, polished. So we're painting a picture of what we're expecting to see in the specular pass. In the diffuse column, we might find descriptions such as soft, flat, ambient, natural, rough, earthy and organic, matte, weathered, and dull. So you can already see there's a bit of contrast here with what we're expecting to see uh, with specular and diffuse. And in the emission column, we might have words such as bright, radiant, luminescent, glowing, self-illuminating, incandescent, electric, beaming, shining, luminous, and illuminated. Let's have a look at some mostly diffuse real-world examples. So we can find a lot of diffuse items in architecture. So things that are made of stone or wood, uh, we have a lot of bricks and, you know, a lot of these old kind of buildings that are, that are lasting the test of time. We have some kind of uh, ceramic rooftop tiles here um, or these stone statues. So and uh, here, here's a building made of a marble here. So we can find a lot of examples in, in architecture. We have stone or rocks, um, ceramic, we have concrete. Um, bars of soap, eggshells, kind of either either this sort of plastic or maybe this is a ceramic cup. Um, some more kind of statues that are that are made of stone. Wood is often very uh, diffuse, so we have you know some wooden spoons and sculptures even of wood, um, and it's usually very kind of dull and earthy. And again, lots of statues, particularly made of stone or ceramic or marble. Let's contrast that with some uh, images that are displaying some high specularity. So we have some glass, very high specularity. It's reflecting a lot of the uh, environment and the lights. So we have big cities, glass jars, uh, glass bottles here. Plastics very often have this kind of very shiny coat and are very uh, specular and they're reflecting all of the vir environment. Um, even this this kind of plastic cup, it sort of it is nothing but just shiny specular highlights here. He's like holding an invisible item except for all the specular highlights. So metal surfaces uh, and things that we can find in everyday household items like chains or, or these uh, metal jars, tools, pipes. Uh, we have you know utensils that we eat with or things like uh, the a faucet in the sink or just you know things that we find in a bathroom. Jewelry is often made of uh, metals or diamonds and very, very high specularity. They're very shiny. That's kind of what makes them uh, attractive is kind of the bling bling of it. Um, we have some medieval armor. Armor is entirely metal. Uh, we can see that it's kind of completely reflecting the environment uh, if it's not like painted or something. And then we have these more kind of complex man-made metal machinery like these barista machines or this uh, tap or telescope, radio, um, some stopwatches here. So really intricate metal uh, detail. It's all reflecting, uh, yeah, all kinds of highlights, uh, environment as being reflected. So just examples of things that are very highly uh, specular. Of course, the, the real world is, is very complex and, you know, items aren't just all specular or all diffuse. Uh, you'll often see scenes with, with uh, both in them, often in the same, in the same item. So here we have a, like a city uh, on this left side and we have, you know, stone buildings with glass uh, windows and metal roofs. We have this kind of camp scene with um, a few really diffuse mugs, but then we have this really shiny container here. We have some utensils that are made of metal, but then have a wooden handle or just, you know, 
some metal spoons next to some wooden spoons. Here are some uh, common interiors that you might see. And, you know, we have this, this couch, which is pretty diffuse, but then has all these uh, specular highlights that are reflecting the window behind it. We have uh, this wooden uh, coffee table with glass in the center of it. Uh, a stone fireplace with also some, some kind of glass or metal uh, front there. And I thought these apples were a particularly good example um, because, you know, the diffuse component of the apple is telling us what color the apples are. So we have green apples and red apples. But then we see that the highlights, because it's very wax, shiny uh, cover of these apples, that, you know, it's reflecting the entire environment. We can see that we're outdoors in maybe some city or something like that. So this is an example of an item that has, you know, both a diffuse and a specular component. Just a few more uh, examples here. For uh, We have this guy here who is, you know, um, a little bit sweaty or he's a little bit wet. And his skin, particularly the parts that are wet, are very reflective. So they're reflecting the blue light in the environment or the uh, lighter that he has in his hand. This fruit that is cut open, um, it's kind of wet on the inside and it has a lot of specular highlights on the skin on the interior. Yeah, the again, the diffuse component of whatever fruit this is, I'm not even actually sure what that is, is, uh, you know, telling us the color of this is kind of a warm, I don't know, maroon color or something. And then we have uh, the specular highlights, which are reflecting the kind of neutral colored windows um, in the environment. We have people's skin, which can, you know, it's telling us the, the color of their skin, but also there's a shiny component, it's an oily uh, sometimes component to, to the skin, which is uh, reflecting the lights and uh, giving us this very shiny, uh, like a shiny face uh, of this woman here. And of course, um, e even on our bodies, we have the diffuse skin. So this guy is, is not sweating or anything, but his eye is very shiny because it's, you know, there's a, there's a film, there's a layer of moisture and film on his eye. And we can even see the room reflected in his eyeball. And let's give a few examples of emission uh, items that you might find in everyday life. So we have a lot of neon lights. Uh, you could see this on like anything futuristic or you see this in neon cities, uh, neon lights that are uh, on these signs of text. So they are literally like shooting light into the scene. And then we have this sort of elemental or heated metal component. So we have this guy uh, pounding away on some metal and it's getting super hot and glowing. Um, yeah, it's quite quite common in metallurgy. Um, we have these really hot coals that are on a uh, shisha or hookah. Um, coals of a fire, for example, you know, embers that are that are really glowing uh, that you might have seen if you've sit around a, a campfire. These sparks, uh, lava. So yeah, just things that are that are so hot that they're that are emitting light into the scene. Now that we've seen some real world examples and we have a context of uh, kind of what we are talking about, let's uh, let's start talking about you know what is going on uh, that is making these different components. Like why is it specular versus dif diffuse or versus uh, emission? I'm going to start with emission because I think it's just the easiest one to explain. So uh, let's just get that one out of the way and then we can start talking about uh, specular and diffuse. So emission. Emission is any object, material, or texture that is actively emitting light into the scene. This includes any lights, superheated metals, or elemental effects like fire, sparks, lightning, magic, etc. So we have some examples uh, here that are just playing some um, sparks and uh, as we talked about before, some superheated metals and stuff. Um, on, on the left side here, we have um, what the emission pass would look like. So the image above, we can see that those panels are emitting light, but um, the in the environment, this these are all diffuse and specular components, but the actual material that is emitting the light, an actual pass, is just that item, uh, that that color, I guess, that, that is emitting that light. So that's what the um, emission pass would look like. Whenever I'm thinking about uh, emission, I'm thinking about like lightsabers from from Star Wars uh, that are just casting light into the scene, or uh, you know things from Tron which have these like bright strips of light that are always shining. Um, and I just threw in um, some uh, uh, Justice League footage uh, where you see the, the electricity of the Flash going everywhere and kind of lighting up the entire scene. 
And as we talked about before, uh, this is very common in neon lights or screens or monitors, like your your cell phone is just basically an, an emission screen that is uh, casting light everywhere. Um, and yeah, you'll see a lot of this in, in cities in the form of uh, these signs and neon lights. So overall emission is pretty easy to spot. Uh, it's just, is that material casting light into the scene? So that leaves us with specular and diffuse and trying to uh, do our best to separate those, uh, those out into different categories. So when we are talking about specular, we are talking about surface level reflections, reflections that are only happening on the surface of a material. In the diffuse component, the light passes through the surface and interacts with the material on a molecular level. And scattering and absorption allow certain colors to re-exit and scatter into the scene, and that is the color that we are perceiving as diffuse. Let's dive deeper and take this apart one step at a time. I'm going to start by just talking about the specular surface level reflections. Let's start with the basics of the, the law of reflection. And this is just stating that uh, any light ray, as it's hitting a surface, the incoming ray, also known as the incidence ray, when it hits the surface, it comes in and hits it at a certain angle, which is known as the incidence angle. And the outgoing reflection ray is the exact same as the incidence ray's angle. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Surface reflections appear differently on smooth versus rough uh, surfaces or materials. So uh, here we have a perfectly smooth mirror surface uh, in the example, and we have an incoming light beam, which is just a, a bundle of parallel light rays. So they're all parallel to each other coming in. They're all hitting the surface at uh, different points, but the angles in, w in which they're hitting is all the same. So uh, that means the, the all the outgoing angles are also the same, and the light beam remains parallel. So because all of the angles remain the same, the image is preserved, albeit it is reversed in the end, uh, which is very typical of a mirror surface. This phenomenon is known as a planar mirror and a virtual image. Uh, it's very typical on a surface of water or glass or mirrors. An image created by a planar specular reflection that does not actually exist as a physical object is referred to as a virtual image. The virtual image appears to be located behind the mirror. The virtual image distance is equal to the object to the mirror and the mirror to the observer. So this man is looking at a virtual image of himself in the mirror and he is perceiving to see himself uh, not where the mirror is but at a distance uh, that is double from him to the mirror because the light travels from him to the mirror and then the mirror back to him. Another cool little fact is that speculum is the Latin word for mirror, which is where the word specular derives from. In this example, we have a, a very strange looking chess piece <laughs> uh, reflected in this mirror. Uh, we can see that there's a very shallow depth of field in, in the image. And I would say that the focal point is, is probably around uh, the keyboard in the background. So where my mouse is here. So even though this chess piece to us in the foreground is very out of focus, uh, in this virtual image, the distance continues on behind the mirror, and we are perceiving this chess piece, which is you know in the foreground, to be in the area of focus. So even though this mirror is completely out of focus, the image uh, of the mirror is seeming to be in focus. It's, it's kind of a crazy uh, optical illusion. But it's just showing you that the distance of the virtual image is actually being uh, respected by the lens optically and giving the correct uh, depth of field. This illustration is showing a ground plane surface reflection and it is kind of illustrating how the virtual image of this tree is appearing to uh, sit directly below the actual image of the tree. Okay, so we talked about what happens when the light hits a surface that is completely flat or smooth. So let's now talk about uh, what happens when a light is hitting a surface uh, with roughness and with a uh, uneven surface. The uneven surface causes the incidence rays to hit at different angles. So depending on where the rays are hitting the surface, it might be facing a slightly different direction. Each individual light ray is following the law of reflection. So because the incoming rays are hitting at slightly different angles, the outgoing reflection rays scatter in different directions. This phenomenon in at least scientific terms is called a diffused reflection. 
Um, and it's a little bit confusing because uh, we're dividing it into diffuse and specular, but um, diffuse is just an adjective for kind of the scattering and spreading out uh, of, of these light rays. And what we are talking about right here uh, is based on this surface level reflection. So none of the light has, has gone into the surface at this point. So a little bit of confusion there with this kind of like adjective of diffuse. Um, but we can just use like a rough reflection if that makes more sense to you. So to illustrate this point a little bit better, I went into Nuke and I have this HDRI setup of this interior um, house here with sort of just floating card of this uh, pumpkin here. And on the uh, bottom, we have a completely flat reflective surface. I'm using Ray Render. And we have basically a, a lot of vertices on the surface. And I'm using a random noise pattern to displace each vertice slightly. So you can imagine each of the vertices are sort of uh, uh, going higher or lower um, over the course of time. And what's happening is it starts out as a completely smooth reflection. And uh, you can see, for example, the pumpkin completely reflected, for example, here in the uh, ground. And as we increase the um, the displacement of the card, the angle starts to change. And because of the randomly facing angles, all of the light rays are being reflected slightly different angle uh, and different parts of the image are being reflected. And it causes the reflection to become quote unquote blurrier. Um, and so this is ultimately the difference between uh, a rough versus a smooth uh, reflective surface. Here are some examples of some rough versus smooth materials in CG. At the top, we have uh, a, basically a slider going from as rough as you can get to all the way glossy. Glossy is another term for smooth. And we can see that, uh, that the image, the reflection, becomes more and more crisp uh, all the way when we get to 100% glossiness. So it ends up looking like a mirror. And just down here, we have some just basic examples of uh, different types of materials like wood or plastic that are along this uh, roughness or glossiness uh, spectrum. Here we have another example where uh, it is a roughness graph and with 0% roughness, so it's not rough at all, it's completely smooth. Again, we have this sort of chrome mirror kind of uh, ball and you can see it just gets prog progressively rougher as we get to 100% where uh, you basically don't even see the reflection anymore. It's just uh, completely kind of diffused and ambient looking. And this image is sort of illustrating that the highlight point, uh, you, we see the sun in that, and that would be on a smooth surface, a very tiny, what we'd call a ping of light. So the highlight's very, very bright where that sun is, but as it gets rougher, the highlight gets spread out and it also gets dimmer. There's a small side note here about what happens when a rough material uh, gets wet and uh, why uh, it go like why wet surfaces look kind of shiny. And uh, we can see this illustration here uh, where the water is filling in the gaps basically of the roughness and it ends up being a flat surface uh, of the water. And the water obviously is also uh, very reflective and specular. So when a surface is wet, the water fills the gaps and flattens the surface and causes a more specular reflection. And we all know this if we've ever driven a car or been on the road when it's raining and we can see basically um, all the highlights from the environment are being uh, really reflected on the ground and the headlights of a car, for example, are uh, shining back at us on the road. When we're talking about these surfaces, we're talking down on like a microscopic level. So you might say to me, well, Tony, um, I have a piece of paper in front of me and it's completely smooth, but it's not like reflecting as if it's a mirror. And <laughs> this uh, image, these images here, are uh, a microscopic zoom in of a actual piece of paper, like a, a A4 or letter paper that you'd see. Um, and we can see that like when you get down to this kind of atomic microscopic level, uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, surface variation there. And um, that's what actually causes a paper to look very diffuse and very flat um, is all this um, roughness that is going on there. So um, we're not talking about like smooth surfaces uh, from, I guess, our scale, but down to like the very surface level um, microscopically is what we're kind of talking about. 
We talked so far about specular reflections that are occurring at the surface level of uh, material. And uh, before we start talking about diffuse of when light is passing through the surface and interacting with the material, uh, we need to introduce a another concept. When dealing with physically based rendering, we need to be aware whether or not the material is metallic or dielectric, non-metallic. The diffuse and specular terms actually describe two distinct effects going on. The light interacts with materials differently depending on whether or not the material is a metal or a non-metal, dielectric. And the main difference would be that a dielectric absorbs and scatters light within, and a metallic does not absorb the light, it only reflects. Let's talk about what's happening with dielectric or non-metallic materials first. So with a dielectric material, the light penetrates the surface level, and the molecules of the material absorb and scatter the light within. In scientific terms, the light photons excite the atoms they hit below the surface. Some of the light is absorbed, and this energy is converted into heat. Then new light rays or photons are emitted from the excited atoms, and those might excite nearby atoms or exit the surface as new photons. These new photons are the same color as our material, it's the light that hits our eyes. So in the case of a dielectric material, the base color texture or albedo map determines the color of the diffusely scattered photons from those excited atoms. It's the color that is scattered back out and not the one that is absorbed by the material. Metallic materials have a completely different effect. A metallic material does not allow the light to penetrate the surface and does not absorb the light. They only reflect light on the surface level. And from a scientific view, metals can be thought of as positively charged ions suspended in a sea of electrons, or an electron gas. This is known as a metallic bond. Attractions hold the electrons near the ions, but not so tightly as to impede the electrons' flow. This flowing of the electrons in the electron gas explains many of the properties of metals, like conductivity of heat and electricity. That's why metals are used in electric wiring, for example. So on metallic materials, the incoming light or photons do not excite the atoms, but bounce directly off the electron gas. So the electron gas layer is sort of acting like a barrier that is not allowing light to pass through. That means all the light that is hitting metallic material is actually bouncing off the surface and can be considered specular reflection. On some metallic materials, the process of the light bouncing off this electron gas layer can actually tint the color of the reflection. Think of gold or copper, for example. So in the case of metallic materials, the base color, or the albedo map, is used to describe the color tint of the specular reflection. So we have a fundamental difference here between metallics and non-metallics in how they are using their base color textures. One is using it to tint the color of the specular reflection, and the other is using it to describe the actual color of the material. Here are some real-world and some CGI versions of metallic materials, and we have this kind of case full of these uh, um, metal balls here that are all different types of roughness levels and different types of materials that uh, we have copper, brass, steel, uh, and aluminium. And we can see um, that the, the color of the environment that is being reflective, specifically on the right side here, the color of the reflection is actually tinting based off of what type of metal it is. And here on the right side, we also have um, some metallic materials, which are tinting the color of the, the specular highlight, depending on what metal it is trying to portray. This is completely different than how a dielectric is operating. So we have uh, here a, a case of, I think, just plastic, yeah, plastic balls here uh, of some different colors. And we can see uh, the big difference here between the, the metal balls and the plastic balls. So all, none of the highlight colors on these plastics are actually changing. Just the color of the material of the ball, so red, white, gray, and black. Um, so there's a huge difference here. One is completely reflecting the environment and tinting that color. And the other one is basically just describing what color uh, the actual plastic is, while the uh, environment highlights uh, are not being tinted. And on the right side, we have um, just a kind of extreme example of these two materials in the CG world. Uh, we have a metal shader and then a completely dielectric shader with, I think, no specular highlight at all. So these two materials are, are the absolute extremes of like a metal versus a dielectric. To give some real world examples of metals and dielectrics, um, on the metal side, we have, you know, gold, jewelry, um, this aluminium can here, which we can see it completely, it, it's almost colorless. It is just reflecting the environment. We can see his hand being reflected uh, through the can. And we have copper pans. Uh, so very shiny, very reflective, 
It has basically no base color at all. The copper is just tinting the color of the kitchen reflection. And on the right side we have some basic materials like rubber or ceramic cups um, or these plastic chairs uh, which in this case are pretty rough and don't have a lot of specular highlights. Um, so these are just kind of real world examples of um, everyday items that might be metal versus dielectric or just you can just think of it as non-metal. If you've worked in visual effects for any amount of time, you've probably seen the classic chrome sphere and diffuse ball that people bring on set and do reference photography with um, or film clean plates with, for example. So what's going on here? Why are they bringing these uh, things on set and why are they so common and useful? The chrome sphere is not just useful for HDR images, although it's, um, it's super useful for that and that's how um, a lot of lighting is recreated but actually it's used as a reference to see what something 100% smooth and metal, specular, looks like, and then something that is 100% rough and dielectric or diffuse looks like in the scene. And so this ends up being a really good way to gather reference of what these two extremes uh, and these two material types look like um, in the environment with uh, the same lighting in the same spot. Now let's finally get into uh, diffuse or, you know, what happens when light is penetrating the surface and interacting with the material and then bouncing back out. And uh, you'll see a lot of these kind of scientific terms, scattering, absorption, refraction, transmission. They all seem very scary. Maybe this image looks a, bit, a little bit complicated, um, but let me just break it down into uh, the components. We can start to talk about them. So we'll start with uh, transmission. Transmission just means any light that is passing through a material or a surface or medium. Um, it, it could also be substituted for the word maybe transparency. So if I was holding a piece of paper up and I had a flashlight behind the paper, you would most likely see the, um, the light shining through the paper and we can tell where, where the light is because the paper is very thin and the light is passing through. So that is basically what transmission means. Refraction, in the simplest definition, is when a light changes direction as it goes through different materials. So the act of hitting the surface of the material is slightly bending or changing the direction of the light when it goes into the material. Absorption is when certain wavelength colors of the light spectrum get absorbed by the material. Uh, and we all kind of learned about this in uh, science class when we were kids. Um, you know, if you wear a black t-shirt in the summer, uh, it gets absorbed, none of the color is escaping, it's warmer than a white t-shirt in which all the colors are reflecting. And so the material itself is um, absorbing some of the energy of the light that's coming in, and then only certain colors are allowed to escape while the other colors um, are absorbed by that material. And finally we have scattering, and that is when light is dispersed in many directions when it comes into contact with the small particles or structures in the material. So when it's bouncing around the atoms or the, the particles, because remember all this is happening at a very atomic level. The light is changing directions, it's bouncing off each other, and some of those lights will bounce back out and go out of the surface again. And those light rays that are exiting the surface, that is the color that we're perceiving, because it's all the color that was not absorbed by the material, and it's all the leftover colors. And so that is what we are seeing, um, of course, when we are looking at everyday items. Here is the all-in-one image uh, of what is going on when the light is penetrating the surface and sort of bouncing around in the material and interacting with it. Lucky for us, all of this light penetration and interaction and scattering is all happening at a, a microscopic atomic molecular scale, uh, which uh, in the end can be simplified down to basically uh, wherever the light is hitting the surface, just give me the color and I'll, <laughs> I'll show you the diffuse color. And so the computer quite likes this simplified calculation. So we can summarize that when the distance that the light travels beneath the surface is insignificant and negligible, the calculation will just be simplified by the renderer and just calculated at the surface point where the light hits. It then uses the base color texture or albedo as the diffuse color that will scatter into the scene, the one that we will perceive the material color to be. So all that real world complicated stuff that's happening over on the left image uh, sort of gets dumbed down uh, on most uh, materials to what you see on the right side, which is where is light hitting? We have one specular component and then one uh, omnidirectional diffuse component that is the color of the material. 
Sometimes the light that is traveling and scattering beneath the surface is not negligible. On some materials and in some instances, we, we might be able to see this distance with our naked eye. So when the distance that the light travels beneath the surface of the material is significant, the interior scattering must be calculated. This is referred to as subsurface scattering, or SSS. We see this phenomenon happening all the time and we don't even really think about it or notice it. So we have this candle image on the left side and clearly the source of light is the flame. So this wax on the candle is not super hot and glowy. It's not illumin like it's not emitting light itself, but the, what's happening is the light from the candle flame is entering the surface of the wax and is able to bounce around and it goes quite far and we end up seeing this light uh, bouncing back at different depth levels. And it's giving this uh, interior illuminated look. The same thing here in the middle of the picture with grapes. We have this direct sunlight from the back and the light is 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 going through the grape. Some of it is, is uh, as we mentioned, transmission. So the light's passing completely through. But what's happening is going into the grape and it's scattering around a bunch at significant distances. And that light is eventually coming back out at us. It also quite famously happens on uh, human skin or any skin, skin of animals. And, you know, if you've ever held your hand against a flashlight before and you notice that your hand is like completely glowing red, that is just the light bouncing around in inside of your skin and then uh, escaping at different distances. So so there's actually some internal scattering that's going on uh, within the skin. This is sort of an expensive render to do because you have to calculate all the interior scattering. And it's also like a, a different type of calculation, which is why we oftentimes get a subsurface scattering pass on its on the side on its own, because it does that calculation all on its own on the side, and then it gives you the result of that calculation. But make no mistake, the subsurface scattering uh, layer is part of the diffuse. It is the color of the material. It's just a light scattering throughout the material at greater interior distances. Let's talk a tiny bit about some physical-based rendering terminology. We have used the term albedo in the slideshow. So uh, an albedo is just a base color texture map. On the CG side, it could be a single color or it could be an actual texture map that you plug in to the material. Now, very importantly, this albedo map can be used in different ways depending on if a material is a metal or a dielectric. On dielectrics or non-metals, this albedo map is referring to uh, the color of the material or the diffuse color. And on metals, it's referring to the color tint or the color shift of the specular reflection. So in old lighting terms before physically based rendering, this might have been known as a diffuse map. But there's uh, some, some differences between diffuse map and what this is. This is supposed to be the pure color of the material when the light is hitting. So in this scenario, the texture map is supposed to be without highlights or shadows or any type of ambient occlusion. So it is supposed to be, if the light is hitting this material, what is the color that is being shown either on the diffuse or what color is the specular reflection being tinted. We are now talking about texture maps that are being plugged in to materials in the CG side to uh, replicate some of this uh, real world um, interactions of the light with the materials. And so we have albedo, which we just talked about, and then we have a metalness map or metal map, and then we have a roughness or also known as glossiness map. A metalness map describes what area is metallic or not. And as we mentioned, depending on if it is metallic or dielectric, that albedo color, that base color texture, will be used differently. This metal map is usually black or white because it is either a metal or it's not, and only on the areas of transition do you get some uh, in-between gray pixels. A roughness map or glossiness map is describing how rough a surface is, which is affecting the specular reflection. Another really easy way to think about that is the roughness map is describing how blurry or how sharp the reflection will be. In these two materials, you can see we have this albedo map and a metalness map and roughness map with the final result. And the metalness map will use this albedo map to uh, either be the color of the material or tint the color of the metal. And the roughness map is blurring some of the reflections and you get the final result combining all the maps and material qualities together. Real life objects and materials often have both specular and diffuse components. So in this image on the right, we just have these billiard balls that are on the pool table. And the diffuse component is describing what the colors of the balls are. 
And if you notice, the specular highlights on all the balls are all the same color. It is reflecting the whatever the light is that is above the table. So we have a diffuse component and a specular component to these objects. I just want to mention in passing that metals are not the only way that a specular reflection can be tinted a certain color. We also have this phenomenon in real life called iridescence. There are also iridescent materials that change specular color depending on viewing angle. Iridescence is a kind of structural coloration due to wave interference of light in microstructures or thin films. Thank you Wikipedia for that definition. Um, I like to think of these uh, like aviator sunglasses that, you know, depending on the angle of the sunglasses, um, you see the, the reflection changing different colors. Also these um, ski goggles or snowboarding goggles. You can find this whenever you blow bubbles in, in uh, the real world or you see an oil slick on the ground. And there's also some of this happening in nature in either some types of plants or um, on insects. If you ever look really closely at an insect's eye, like a fly, for example, you will notice that their their eye, the film of their eye, um, has an iridescent quality to it. And it's kind of multicolored. Jumping into Nuke, we have our fruit ball render, and we can start to divide that into our diffuse specular and emission categories and see what they look like. So this is all of the diffuse component of the fruit ball render, and you notice all the specular highlights are gone, and these are sort of the colors of the materials themselves. And on the specular side, we have all the highlights and all the reflections, including on the ground of the emission object. These highlights, as we learned, are going to be the colors of the light source in these cases because they're dielectrics and not metals. And in the emission pass, we just have the emitting object, which is that light that's in our scene and actually does have some color information if you expose down the viewer. If we simply plus these passes together, uh, we start to rebuild our beauty render and the end result will be one to one with our beauty. Say I wanted to change the color of this fruit here. Well, if I just put a grade node on top of the beauty node, um, it would start to look a little bit strange because I'm actually color correcting the specular highlights and they should be the color of uh, the light source. So if I did the same color correction on just the diffuse pass, which is basically changing the base color of the fruit, then when I add the specular highlight back on top, uh, we can see that I'm affecting the color of the fruit, but not the highlights, and it's uh, appearing a little bit more realistic uh, than just color correcting everything at once. I can also throw a grade node on the specular only column, and we can start to uh, change the reflectivity of some of the fruits. So we can decide if we want to make this apple a bit shinier or a bit duller. So you can see that we get a lot of control over the properties of our materials with just this basic division of diffuse specular and emission. Let's try to recap some of the important takeaways of this presentation. Emission or illumination materials emit light. Specular and diffuse can be separated by surface level reflections and below surface material interactions. Each individual light ray follows the law of reflection. The smoother the surface is, the more mirror-like the specular reflection will be. The roughness of a surface will cause reflected rays to scatter and the reflection to be blurred. Metallic materials do not allow light to enter the surface, they only reflect light. Dielectric materials allow light to enter the surface. Light rays are refracted, absorbed, or scattered by the material's molecules. Certain color wavelengths re-exit the surface in random direction, which is what we perceive as the material's color. Albedo is the base color texture map. On dielectric, it's the color of the material, and on metals, it's the color tint of the specular reflection. Subsurface scattering is when light below the surface travels a significant distance before re-exiting. And iridescent materials tint the color of a specular reflection depending on the viewing angle. Here is a final slide of the major themes that we just talked about. Specular, diffuse, and emission, and metallic and dielectric. So with some of the knowledge of what is happening in the real world uh, with materials, and also what uh, lighters are trying to do in CG of replicating those materials, um, uh, to render passes for us, hopefully we can start to see the separation between what we consider specular and diffuse and why it's important to separate these things out. I guess the overall goal here is also to familiarize ourselves with some of the terminology and to help us as compers better communicate with a lighter. If the lighter is, is using some of these terms, uh, maybe now you can be a little bit more familiar with um, how the materials are operating, which will also give you some more knowledge at the end of the day of how to comp things better. Because in the end, 
uh, with material AOVs, these are the qualities of the materials that you're actually affecting. You're actually trying to change the way the material looks. So we need to know basically how the material is constructed so we know also um, how we can change it or what's the appropriate way to change uh, what we need. This was a really complicated topic and uh, I learned a lot myself as I tried to digest and uh, reteach um, this information. And I really hope that I did the topic justice and uh, that lighters, you know, uh, don't crucify me or anything. I do think it's a net benefit for compers to sort of be aware of how the sausage is made uh, in the render uh, and how materials are being put together. So thank you for watching. Uh, I'm hoping to have some more videos coming out uh, very shortly. And there was an addition to this topic which was a bit too long for, for this video, so I'm, I'm putting it as a side video uh, talking about polarization of light. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that one. I'm Tony Lyons, and see you in the next video.